السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد زاك الله خير thank you brothers and sisters for coming in today uh, we appreciate uh, you coming in I hope I'm not too loud inshallah I'm a little excited today uh, especially for the topic our uh, professor Ma uh, Mustafa Hijazi he is uh, signing in right now uh, he's going to be talking about is there a creator it's a very interesting topic as you can find many of the uh, Muslims have, have uh, dived into this topic and you can find resources uh, especially I mean going back way back to Imam Ghazali anyway I uh, just wanted to um, thank you for coming just a couple of uh, house rules as you know uh, last week unfortunately we didn't have class as we had mentioned uh, before and uh, we're gonna have uh, classes coming up every Thursday inshallah for the next uh, five weeks inshallah including this week and um, we have uh, Dr. Sabil will be talking about the manners of a caller, manners of a da'i, how to share Islam in five minutes. This is an excellent uh, topic. Uh, you, you know, uh, how to give da'wah in 10 minutes or shahad in 10 minutes kind of concept. And uh, we have uh, uh, some uh, tough questions, easy answer, demystifying, you know, some of the verses of the Quran and things of that nature. So just wanted to uh, put that out there um, as we um, brother signs in. Um, you can find uh, the previous courses, and I know uh, some of you have uh, already sent me an email uh, wanting all the course material, all the presentations and things like that. I still have your email, and I'm putting that together because I haven't gotten all the uh, uh, the uh, presentations from all the uh, speakers are, as yet. So I'm hoping, inshallah, by this weekend I should be able to gather all that together, and I will send it out to you if you have... Uh, requested it and um, hoping at the end of this semester which is again you know after today there'll be four more classes uh, if you have attended all the classes we will be uh, handing out uh, maybe a s small questionnaire just to uh, get your pulse as to how your classes uh, has been going and your comprehension and I know uh, some of the classes is very overwhelming because there's so much material to cover but uh, inshallah, in the second semester, we will try to um, go about in a more realistic, a more dawah, uh, sort of like a convention as to the how to step by step, uh, if you will. And we'll try to be a little bit more focused. So uh, if, you, if you can bear with us, again, our courses are online. Uh, and um, I'll try to share that in the chat group if you have any questions. I'm going to pop out the questionnaire right now, um, the questions, inshallah, if you can, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask questions during the uh, session, and we, I'll try to answer some, and as uh, the brother Mustafa, or Professor Mustafa uh, Hijazi starts to um, speak, I will try to focus on, just on the uh, conversation that he's talking about, we, I'll try to take some notes of myself, but um, again at the end of the course if you have uh, been attending and you wanted to review the material because you know it's an everyday activity that we are um, talking with our neighbors talking with our friends you know talking to people trying to help them because we love them we're muslims we want to uh you know we want the best for them so inshallah we can um uh, practice some of the things that they are uh, presenting for us and, you know, like I said, I keep saying that you can get most of this material that we have. You can get most of this material online at uh, whyislam.org, you know, concept of God in Islam, hijab in Islam, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, things of that nature. So you can find, you know, many of these good and small pamphlets uh, and nice discussion topics, inshallah. Uh, that you can uh, sharpen your skills with and you can have conversations with them. Um, we will wait, inshallah, for our brother um, to come in and see what he he's not here yet uh, to do, inshallah. I can get my presentation going if he's not here. One second.
Okay, so I'm gonna just ask you a question. I'm gonna share my screen right now. Give me one second here, let me get a PowerPoint presentation format. Inshallah, sorry, inshallah, just a little bit of patience, inshallah. Okay, so can you see my uh, screen, inshallah? Just uh, let me know if you can see my screen. No, unfortunately, there is no issue right now with the um, thing. Maybe if you try to go back out and come back in. Um, in the, then you, you can, inshallah, you can... Uh, Hopefully that works. Okay, here you go. Uh, can someone uh, take a look at this? Uh, what are your initial thoughts? You see, look at this uh, person here. This is a brother that he's been, um, you know, literally worshiping a devil. He see, he has some tattoos on there. He used to worship devil, and one day he was interested in brothers giving dawah. Uh, sorry, you can't see. I can't see the picture. So, yeah, okay, here you go, inshallah, here you go. Can, um, can you see the screen now? Yeah, thank you. So, um, this brother here, he's a European brother. He, he uh, now he's a brother. Before he was, you know, if you if you saw him on the street, you probably would run because uh, you know to the other side. He's he used to be a devil worshiper. He became a Muslim, and uh, he saw the people with uh, you know that was giving dawah, and he went up to them and he asked for a Quran, and he got the Quran and he started reading it. Uh, you know, the idea behind this is that you don't know. Uh, we don't really know what the people are thinking, uh, what 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 uh, is actually going through their minds, and you you know you can't really be, be judgmental about the people because sometimes we don't know who is going to uh, accept this message. As you know, uh, some of the Sahabas, uh, Omar ibn Khattab, you know, like they said, they used to uh, be walking on the other side of the street when they saw him because they didn't want to mess with him. And just like that, you, you find a lot of people who have become Muslims today, you never expected that uh, from them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides who he wills. Uh, he guides who he wills. So uh, there's a lot of um, uh, people out there that they're dying inside internally. They're dying for, 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 for guidance. So uh, we want you to, when you see people, uh, you see people out there, you know, it's simple conversation. Hi, how you doing? You know, nice. And, and some people are going to notice. They're going to notice your hijab. They're going to notice your your beard. They're going to notice your maybe your brown skin or your kufi or whatever the case is, um, because you want to express that for them. You know, like to them that you're Muslim. And and this is really our objective here as, as in in this country or in the West. Um, sometimes you know we're not going to do that. Inshallah. Um, some sometimes when when um, here yeah when sometimes when we we're discussing things we wanted to always you know give people our side of the story we don't want them to um, uh, to be able to to see with uh, their lens you know sometimes people have gone through some things especially if they're Christians you, you have people who have 
uh, gone through, they've grown up all their life, and, and they've been most uh, Christians all their life, they've been to church and everything else. So when you're giving dawah, you want to find commonality, you want to find some common grounds between you and them. So you want to sort of empathize with them, you want to, you know, like reach out to them, you want you want to give the message as a compassionate message, you know. Imagine the Prophet وسلم, when he was calling these people, he was calling them to uh, Islam. He wanted to save them. He didn't. It didn't matter. Uh, he didn't matter. It didn't matter how bad they were, or how how vicious they were, or how you know like treacherous they were. He wanted to convey a, a compassionate message to them. So when we see people out there, you know, they might we might think that they're they're um uh, they're in their ill intent, uh, they're, they're bad and whatever the case is. But your goal as a Muslim is you want to give them a clear message. You wanted to give them a message that w when you finish dealing with them, even though at that time they might say, you know, they, they might reflect and say, you know what, maybe I was over overreacting. Maybe I was angry. Maybe I should have, shouldn't have, you know, said what I, I said. However, However, when they realize that you were kind, you were compassionate, you were you 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 were you were patient with them, and and you were smiling, and you you weren't you know condescending and things like that, they're like you know what? There's something different. There's something different about that person that was talking to me, that brown skin person or that sister with the hijab, you know, that head covering. It was something different about her she looked like she was content she looked like she was satisfied she looked like she had something that is more intriguing and you know it might be five years down the road ten years down the road they might run into another person at the grocery store that might want to help them or something like that so we want we don't want to um it, you know sort of like um uh, give a bad impression on them and you know sometimes things happen unfortunately uh, things happen and and we might not be able to convey our message in the way we planned it but then Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah am wa I heard? Salam. Wa alaikum salam haji sorry man you're you're there yes can you hear me yes sir clearly go for it bismillah perfect perfect jazakallah khair Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. All praise is due to Allah and may the finest peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon all his prophets and messengers alike, including the final messenger and prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, greetings to all. Much apologies for the delay. I had some technical issues in logging in, but alhamdulillah, we're here now, so uh, inshallah, we can take advantage of the allotted time. And the topic of today is, is there a creator? Now, this is a very essential topic, and the reason being is because we live in a secular society and one where new atheism is on the rise. New atheism is on the rise both here in the U.S., in the U.K., and many other places around the world. And um, we need to unite as theists, and specifically Muslim theists. And we really need to engage with those who, you can say, lack belief in God or even lack belief in religious systems. And one way we can do that is by learning about their paradigm, learning about their ideology, learning about their backgrounds too on a personal level, not just necessarily a ideological level, but also who they are and their background and what led them to their current belief, right? And so God's existence um, has a lot to do with this topic, uh, specifically atheism. Because atheists, if you look at the word atheism in itself, according to the Oxford Dictionary, it means by definition, it's, it's really like a paradigm. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a religion as, as a dictionary itself states, but it's more so a worldview, you can say, or an ideology in which a person who adheres to it lacks belief in God or lacks belief in religion. That's the definition of atheism. And thus, when you engage with someone, as Brother Azad was saying, you want to engage with them on a very compassionate level on who they, learning about who they are, right? 
And this is essential. And of course, to have mannerism and so on and so on. So after you've been through the initiation and you started a conversation with your interlocutor or with someone whom you're engaging with in dialogue, you want to ask them and you always want to start with this question after you've started the initiation. Go into God's existence and learn more about them and what they believe in terms of the higher being. Do they believe in a higher being? Do they believe in um, a creator? Do they believe in something greater than themselves? I mean, whichever way you want to articulate it to them. But mo most importantly, it's, it's important to understand what their current belief is and how did they lead or how did their specific upbringing lead them to their worldview? And so once you get there, we start asking them, do they believe in God or not? Um, typically, you have three types of categories um, when it comes to individuals um, who adhere to atheism. You have first the positive atheist. So one who adheres to positive atheism. And positive atheism is when someone asserts that there is no God. It's a positive assertion. It's a positive claim where they kind of confidently claim and state that there is no God. The second is the negative atheist, or we call it negative atheism, in which really it's someone, or it can also be, by the way, it's also known as, aka, weak atheism. It's someone who doesn't necessarily have a positive claim or a positive assertion, but it's more so someone who, who says, I don't have enough evidence for a creator, for God. So it's sort of um, a disbelief in God, but it's because they feel they don't have enough evidence. They don't go to the level of, of the positive atheist and say or claim that there is no God. They don't say that. They just say there is not enough evidence according to what they believe. And then you have the veiled agnostic. This is called veiled agnosticism. Veiled agnosticism is one who accepts I don't know as a philosophy. I don't know as an ideology, meaning they don't reject the idea of a creator, a high, higher being, and they also don't accept it. They're just agnostics. They don't know. Um, and, and that's about it. So those are the three main classes or categories, you can say, when it comes to God's existence on the atheistic paradigm or framework. Now, from, for the theist, of course, we are believers in God. We believe in a higher being, a first cause, the eternal, the almighty, all powerful, and so on. So we do differ with our atheist friends in that regard. Now, again, you want to learn about the, the person and then and carry the conversation forward. When you do, um, make sure you ask them, do you believe in God? Do you believe in a creator? And if they say, I mean, if it's a positive atheist, right? <laughs> Meaning who's some, someone who claims that there is no God, or even if it's a weak atheist or an agnostic. I mean, honestly, the arguments that I'm going to present to you today, inshallah ta'ala, are relevant to all, and honestly, the reminders for ourselves as well. And so, um, one of the first arguments that you can present, and when we say argument, we mean jadala, right? Because jadala is something that's allowed in the Quran. For, for example, Surah An-Nahl, chapter 16, verse 125, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, Ud'u ila sabilu rabbika bil hikmah wal ma'adhatil hasana wa jadilhum billati ahsan. Invite people or call people to the way of your Lord with what? With wisdom and beautiful preaching. Meaning target the mind and target the heart. Wa jadilhum. The word jadilhum comes from, from the word jadala, and jadala means to reason or to argue, and it's not meant to uh, entail uh, derogatory argumentation, but more so uh, intellectual argumentation. And so one intellectual uh, construction is the cosmological argument, right, to uh, make the person realize the reality of the cosmos, right, the, the, the design around us and the first cause. So take, take a very simple example, i.e., you know, your phone, and present to them your phone and ask them a very simple question. Ask them, would you agree that this phone, you can, you can actually uh, coin it to them in two different ways. You can say, would you agree that this phone has been caused, meaning it came to existence? And of course, they'll say, absolutely. That's one way to ask them. Another way to ask them is, um, do you, would you agree if I said that this phone has designed, therefore it has a designer? That's another way you can bring it out. So really, with the phone, you can present both the cosmological argument and something else called the teleological argument. The teleological argument we're going to get into shortly, but it's more about the fine-tuning and design of things as opposed to the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument really deals with the first cause principle, meaning that everything that comes to exist has a cause, right? And we apply this to anything, really even the universe. So this is the cosmological argument. And so you can present it to them in that way. You know, 
if you if if you saw this phone in the midst of a desert, would you not agree that, for instance, it, it was it was created, it came to existence, right? So these are these are ways that you can present the cosmological argument. But um, basically, in a nutshell, this is based on on the Quran because the Quran presents the cosmological argument, and we like to call it the Quranic argument. Now, what's interesting is the cosmological argument from an academic point of view, it was actually coined by um, a Christian philosopher named William Lane Craig, and he actually coined it as Kalam, cosmological argument. So the cosmological argument by default is known as the Kalam, cosmological argument. And the word Kalam actually means a spoken word. And it's interesting because this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us when it comes to the first cause or creating things rather, right? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates things, creates something, right? right? Um, he creates it out of a will, and he creates it by, by, for instance, the word kun, right? Kun fayakun. And this is how he created Isa ibn Maryam, subhanAllah, right? Interestingly. But but the point is, this is how the, the universe itself was also created. So this is called the cosmological argument. We like to call it the Quranic argument. And why is it called the Quranic argument? Because it's mentioned in the Quran. So in Surah At-Tur, in chapter 52, Right, verses 35 and 36. It says, Am min Am Am wal ard, bal la And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Were they created were they created from nothing or by nothing? Were they themselves were, were they the ones who created themselves? Did they create the heavens and the earth? Finally, rather, they are not certain. And so the Mufassirun, the ulama. They said that this, despite the fact that these verses actually apply to the human being, right? Because it says, were they created by nothing, meaning the human being, or did they create themselves? Did they create the heavens and the earth? Rather, they're not certain. Because it has to do with things that came to existence, it's applicable to the universe as well. And so you can apply this to the human being. You can also apply it to the universe based on the ulama. And so when we apply this to the universe, we have a deductive argument. A deductive argument is a number of premise that follow with a conclusion. And so the deductive argument is as follows. Either the universe was created by nothing, or the universe created itself, or the universe was created by something else that was created, or the universe was created by something uncreated. Okay, so this is essentially the Quranic argument, and it does entail, and it brings in the cosmological argument per the cosmos. So, was the universe created by nothing? If you go through this deductively, we reach a conclusion. Well, we, we know philosophically that it doesn't make sense to believe that, you know, things come out of nothing. We have no empirical evidence that things just appear in, uh, from thin air, right? So you always need something to give you something. You can't get, you, you, you essentially can't get, some, you can't get something from nothing. You need something to give you something. So philosophically, we would say it's a logical impossibility to believe that things were created by nothing. The second premise or the second option you can say is, well, for instance, was the universe self-created? Did the universe create itself? Well, in order for something to create itself, it has to pre-exist and post-exist at the same time simultaneously which is, again, a logical contradiction. It's a fallacy, and it's a logical impossibility. So we reject that as rational human beings. Um, thirdly, did the universe um, was it created by something else that was created? Well, if you're going to say the universe was created by something else that was created, then now you're saying a universe was created by another universe. If a universe was created by another universe, then the only thing you can ask from there is, well, what created that universe? Right. And then what created that universe and what created that universe that falls into something called the absurdity of the infinite regress, infinite regression. Right. So if you say universe A, for instance, was created by universe B, the only other thing you can say from there is, well, perhaps universe C created it or perhaps universe D created it and so on. And that falls into infinite regression. And this is a big problem. I mean, philosophers and theologians have been grappling with this for centuries upon centuries, and they can't find a solution for the infinite regress. Meaning, there has to be a first cause. And you know what, dear respected brothers and sisters, this first cause has to be uncreated. And that leaves us with the final premise, we can say even the conclusion, that the only rational and logical option is that 
the universe was created by an entity that is uncreated. And if that is the case, then this uncreated being has to be eternal, has to be the first cause, has to be all powerful, it has to be powerful because it created, right? And it's not limited by the creation of which it created. It has to be intelligent. It has to have intelligence. And thus we see intelligence around us. It has to be all loving. It has to be compassionate. It has to be merciful to its creation. SubhanAllah, when you align all these attributes, they're very consistent with Asma'ullah al-Husna, with the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus, where are we leading to here? When we speak to an atheist, we're leading them to Tawheed. We're leading them to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deductively. And this Quranic argument is extremely powerful in presenting that. And thus, we, we must utilize what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in terms of jadala, in terms of argumentation. And again, it's meant to entail reasoning and not necessarily derogatory argumentation. Moving forward, we conclude there, therefore that the universe has a beginning. And because the universe has, has a beginning, we put forward again this deductive argument. The deductive argument goes as follows. You have two premises followed by a conclusion. The first premise is whatever begins to exist has a cause. That's very logical. That's based on the Kalam cosmological argument as mentioned. And so, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the second premise, the universe began to exist, meaning there's a point in time in which the universe began or initiated existence, came to existence. Finally, therefore, the universe has a cause. And now we must ask, if this deductively follows, and if there is no, you can say, contradiction in the argument, then we can conclude that the conclusion is valid. And if the conclusion is valid, we ask, what is that cause? Well, again, if you go through it deductively, that cause has to be eternal. That cause has to be the first cause. That cause cannot be created. That cause cannot be contingent. It can't rely on the creation. And the cause has to be almighty, all powerful, all hearing, all loving, and so on and so on. All these standard attributes of the first cause are very evident and not just evident, they're rational and not just that, they're intuitive and intrinsic. They're based on the fitrah, the natural disposition, which we all believe, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al that every child, every son of Adam is born in a natural inclination, in a natural disposition to believe in the first cause, to believe in the higher being, to believe in an all-powerful, all-eternal first cause being. Moving forward, when we put this deductively as mentioned, how did the universe come to exist? Did it come from nothing? Absolutely not. We don't believe things come from nothing. We have no empirical evidence of such thing. And you can present many examples uh, which uh, prove that obviously things don't just appear from nothingness. Did it create itself? We said no, because that's like, for instance, that's like saying, did your mother give birth to herself? Or can you create yourself? It just doesn't make sense. It's not sensible for any rational person. And we also said that infinite regression is an issue. Therefore, the universe couldn't have been created by another universe or something else that's created because that would fall into infinite regression. Therefore, what makes most sense, what's most logical and rational, and also what's based on Occam's razor, which means the, um, the, ex the, the explanatory matter that has the least parameters, is that there is a creator. Moving forward, we talked about the cosmological argument, the first cause argument, and we talked about the Quranic argument. Now we'll also present, before we end, inshallah, we'll present the teleological argument. So the teleological argument is very convenient, um, specifically for those who you can say um, have limited experience with speaking to atheists because it tends to be a powerful argument and allows people to connect to their fitrah. And it does so by presenting design and it presents laws around you. It makes a person aware of the realities around them. And so when you observe the planets, solar systems, galaxies, stars, everything around you in the universe, you can conclude rationally that there must be a creator, there must be a designer, there must be something great that exists. Going back real quick to the phone example, right? Because we said that the phone example can um, really point to the teleological argument as well. You can present it this way. You can say, would you agree that the phone has design? Yes, they'll say yes, absolutely. Would you say that the phone therefore has a designer? Yes, absolutely. Would you say that the universe is more complicated in design than the phone? 
they would have to say, yes, of course the universe is more complicated in design than the phone is. Therefore, you conclude, if the phone has design, therefore has a designer, then it would mean that the, the universe, which has more design, has a greater designer. It's very um, logical when you think of it that way. And so I think you can present it to them in a very simplistic manner as such. Moreover, order in our solar system. Again, this has to do with the teleological argument. This has to do with design. It has to do with order, with fine tuning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a teleological argument. These aren't arguments, brothers and sisters, these are not philosophical arguments that we're creating or, or innovating. These are teleological, cosmological, Quranic arguments. They all exist within the Quranic discourse, within the Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah uh, framework. And so, for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 3 in Surah Ali Amran, verse 190, that indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth, in the alteration of night and day are indeed signs for those people, those folks of understanding, people who take heed of what's around them. So everything is obvious around us. Intelligence is, is all around us. And so anything that is ordered indicates intelligence, right? Consider, for instance, if you went to a beach, right? You take a walk on the beach and you saw the word hello written in the sand, perfectly written. You would conclude that there was some intelligence behind that, right? And so, for example, consider you woke up one day in a factory and you saw systems, right? You saw machines manufacturing jeans, for example, or clothes. You're going to obviously conclude that there's some intelligence behind that factory. Well, again, you can present the teleological argument in that way. Well, if a factory, for example, that runs production lines is complicated and has intelligence, wouldn't you say that everything around us is a huge factory, a greater factory, and thus has order, has intelligence, and must have a designer? It's just very logical. And so we apply this to the universe. And what we see is our solar system is very ordered. It's much more ordered than something as, as mere as a factory or a company. But a solar system is highly ordered. And it has laws. It has patterns. It has fine tuning. Here are some examples. Consider, for instance, the sun's distance from the Earth. Uh, it's at a perfect distance. If it was a little bit further, if it was a little bit closer, we would either freeze or we would burn. And this is actually something that is accept by, accepted by modern day scientists, of course, is that the sun is placed in a specific location, subhanAllah. And that entails fine tuning. That's the point, is you want to show that there's intelligence. And, he and hence, this is the teleological argument. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the teleological argument in many places, not just in chapter 3, verse 190. Another verse, for example, would be in Surah Al-Baqarah in chapter 2, verse 164. Um, uh, and then it says, And then it says, in the and so on and so on, all the way to the end of the verse. It's a very long ayah. But basically, it brings about all the teleological realities and truths that exist around us, whether it's the wind, the clouds, the rains, uh, again, the solar system, the universe as a whole, right? the alteration of day and night, the heavens and earth, and so on. All of it are signs for those who may, who may take heed. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to convey this to others so that they can also take heed of this and so that their fitrah can be, inshallah ta'ala, awakened. Consider gravity, for example, the gravitational force. If there was any alteration to it, it would affect our existence. Life would cease to exist. Likewise, again, going back, if the sun was a little closer or further, life would cease to exist. Life wouldn't exist. The, ozone's, the ozone layer, it's meant to protect us. It's like a protecting roof. It protects us from harmful rays. If that didn't exist, we would be harmed. So we wouldn't exist the way we do today. The axis of the earth, the size of the sun and the moon, all of these things are placed for us. They're situated in a manner that's, that allows us to live in the dunya, that allows us to live in, in our locations. So very interestingly, it, it's, it, it goes to show that design points to a designer. It goes to show that physical laws or laws in general point to a lawmaker. And when you have a lawmaker, when you have a designer to this level, to this magnitude, it should really indicate to us that there's something much greater than what we may perceive, what we may 
visually and empirically view with our eyes. So in conclusion, we say that because there's order in the universe, there is intelligence. And that intelligence, we say, in the Islamic theological worldview, the paradigm, the religion, the faith, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there are contentions on God's existence. We're going to go through them, inshallah, briefly because we're running out of time. But let's go through them quickly. The first one is, if God, let's say they agree with you, okay? If they say, okay, it makes sense that perhaps there may be a higher being. But then they may ask a question like this, and it's a very common contention that's brought up. They'll say something like this. If God created everything, then who created God? Right? It's a very, you can say, common question. People bring it up here and there. It's specifically in the field that we hear it often. But the answer is very simple, to be honest, and we kind of already answered it. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote the Prophet ﷺ because he actually mentioned this already. The Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith, يَأْتِي أَحَدَكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ فَيَقُولْ مَنْ خَلَقَ هَذَا فَيَقُولُ اللَّهِ فَيَقُولْ مَنْ خَلَقَ هَذَا فَيَقُولُ الله فَيَقُولْ مَنْ خَلَقَ الله So basically, the Prophet ﷺ warned us about this. And he said that the shaitan, the, the, the devil, the shaitan will come to one of you and say, who created this? And you will say Allah. And then he will say, who created that? And you will say Allah. And then he'll ask you a very deceptive question. He'll ask you, who created Allah? Who created God? And the sunnah is when you hear this, you say, Amantu Billah, I believe in Allah, and you say, Audu Billah min al Shaitan al Rajim, I seek refuge in Allah from the accursed Shaitan. And so, from a logical po point of view, the Quran already answers this. It's mentioned in Surah At-Tur, uh, chapter 52, verse 35 36. We already presented that you cannot have an infinite regress. By definition, if there is a first cause who, who we say is God, you cannot have anything before that. You can only have one first cause. So simple. The creator, by definition, cannot be created. If you say the creator is created, you're falling into something called the category mistake. It's a fallacy where you try to apply specific properties to something that doesn't befit that matter. And so with God, it doesn't befit that he was created. If a God is created, it's not God. It means it's a created item. It's a created matter. And God is not limited by space by time or by matter. So who created God? Again, it really falls into infinite aggression when you ask those kind of questions and it falls into the category mistake fallacy. And in conclusion, we say the, the creator by definition cannot be created. The creator is uncreated. Therefore, the creator is the first cause. The second contention is, why do we need God when science and evolution explain our existence? Well, we have to understand the philosophy of science. We need to understand what science is. So science in itself is just a tool and it helps us derive truths, but it only derives truths in the physical world and not necessarily the metaphysical world. When we talk about God and we talk about angels and things that we don't see, that's called metaphysics. That's all metaphysical. So science doesn't work in the metaphysical realm. It only works in the physical realm. And when we talk about you know, evolution, well, evolution is, just a scientific theory, right? And science, again, it presents observations. It puts forward a hypothesis or a theory. It tests it. And that's all. Uh, that's as far as it can go. It can, it can create valid scientific theories, but it can't really go further than that. And the reason being is because it, it relies on something called the inductive method or the inductive fallacy. And so let me give you an example. Let's say, for instance, I observe 1,000 sheep. And based on my observation of 1,000 sheep, they're all white. So I say, because I observed 1,000 white sheep, therefore all sheep are white. That's a valid scientific conclusion. No problem. It's a theory. But let's say I wake up the next morning and I view empirically with my own eyes a black sheep, one black sheep. If I just see one black sheep, it invalidates my entire theory. And that's the nature of science, brothers and sisters. So evolution, by the way, in itself, even if, here, even if evolution, I'm going to say this very bluntly, and you could, t you could talk to any evolutionist, any atheist, and most of them will agree. Even Richard Dawkins agrees, agrees with this, who is pretty much, you can say, the, the, um, the highest of, of calibers when it comes to atheism, when it comes to atheist academics, right? So even he himself would agree that evolution doesn't disprove God, because evolution can merely be a product of design, right? It could just be design. By God. Now, even in Islam, we don't believe that, right? We do believe 
um, for instance, Adam alayhi salam, he was larger in size. And over time, you know, he, we all shrunk as, as human beings. That's as far as we go. But we can't say we have no empirical proof to show that we uh, evolved from chimpanzees and, or, or monkeys. We don't go by the tree of life foundation that Darwin put forward. And what's interesting is Darwinism in itself isn't factual. It's still a theory. And it's, a pro it's actually a very problematic theory at this point. And the reason why it's problematic is because it's based on a probabilistic framework. It's based on assumptions, and it has many disputes in academia. There's many. There's also many versions of evolution. There's Lamarckian evolution. There's Darwinism. There's evolutionary biology. Um, there's many others. There's genetic evolution and many others. So all of these are just are just theories. And again, Darwin himself, when you look at his works, Origin of Species, his book, he has a, an entire chapter titled Problems with My Theory. And in his section titled Problems with My Theory, he discusses how there are some things that have to be validated in order for his theory to remain authentic. One of them is that we would be able to find fossils of hybrid types in millions, hybrid fossils. However, we don't find this. We don't have any evidence of hybrid fossils. And by the way, a hybrid fossil is a fossil that which, for instance, show um, animals or creatures that are, for instance, you know, half uh, reptiles and half of another uh, category or another genus. So you would have two types of genus, but you don't have fossils like that. You don't have like a, a half monkey, half alligator type fossil. So Darwin himself said in his book, and you can look it up, Origin of Species, he has an entire section, Problems with My Theory. And in there, he says that if we are not to find these hybrid fossils in the near future or in the future, we can throw out his entire uh, Darwinian theory. So we, we need to we need to um, keep keep this in mind and understand that evolution is just based on the scientific method, and the scientific method is limited philosophically. It's limited epistemologically. It's limited. Next, um, and we're taking a lot of time here, so inshallah we're going to wrap up in the next few minutes. The next contention is I have never seen God, therefore he does not exist. Well, this is based on empiricism and. You know, um, many atheists are empiricists, meaning they only believe what they see. And that, that's a problem. That, that really is a problem. Epistemologically, that's a problem. Um, I'm using this word epistemology. Epistemology means the knowledge of knowledge. How you come to know something is true or how you come to know something is valid or authentic. So if someone says, I have never seen God, therefore he does not exist. That's really an empirical fallacy because there's many things that we don't see with our eyes and we believe in. For instance, you believe that your great, 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 great grandmother lived at one point in time and that this person existed. You never seen her. You probably don't know where her grave is, where her remains are, if there are any. You have no idea. But you know what? You still believe that she existed. So if you believe that your great, 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 great grandmother existed, how can you not believe that almighty God doesn't exist considering that you have all these teleological truths around you, all this intelligence and fine tuning. I would say that you have more evidence for the creator than you have for your great, 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 right? Great grandmother. And consider, for example, something as simple as China or Zimbabwe. Let's take Zimbabwe as an example, right? Um, if someone came to you and said, or if you want, let, let's say your question on Zimbabwe, right? So if I asked you, have you ever visited Zimbabwe? I mean, um, or how do you know Zimbabwe exists? I mean, obviously you would say, well, I never visited it, right? So, I mean, does it necessarily then imply that you have proof that Zimbabwe exists? I mean, how can you prove Zimbabwe exists is really the question. Can you prove Zimbabwe exists? Can you prove China exists? The only thing you can go off of is testimony. You can go off of, you know, for instance, Google Map, what you hear from people, but if you yourself have never visited China or never visited Zimbabwe, you have no empirical proof, meaning you have not observed it for yourself. Therefore, you can't necessarily t take it as you, you'd be contradicting yourself. If you were to say, I have never seen God, therefore he does not exist. You would be contradicting yourself if you believe China and Zimbabwe and all these other places exist, despite the fact that you haven't seen them. Because again, while there is proof that China exists, or let's say not, let's not use the word proof because that's a very loose way of using it. Let's use the word evidence. While you do have evidence that China exists and Zimbabwe exists, you do not have absolute evidence. However, for the creator, 
you have creation, you have intelligence, you have what points to a first cause. And without validating the first cause, you fall into something called the infinite regression, as we pointed out. So I would say you have much more evidence for a creator than you do for China existing, for Zimbabwe existing, and even your great, 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 great grandmother existing combined. SubhanAllah. And this is why uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Summon Bukman Omyun, that, you know, those who don't acknowledge something like this, don't acknowledge your creator, really, it's, it's, it's blindness in a sense. You know, it's theological blindness. It's blindness of, of the creator, of the one who created you. Wallahu al-Mustan. Finally, the last contention is, suppose God does exist. Why does God allow evil things to happen in the world? Well, evil is subjective. And evil is how we perceive it. So the perception of evil changes from person to person. And we can say this, that if God exists, God doesn't intend evil. And we can see that played out all over the world and we can give many examples. It's all about perception. We understand that in our theology that God has the picture, we only have the pixel. For instance, let's say you go to a friend's house, a, a friend's home. And this is called, this is like the shay analogy that I like to give. Let's say, let's say you go over a friend's home and you're going to um, spend some time with your friend, have some shay, have some tea, and you hear some screaming in the background, in the other room. You assume automatically, right? You assume automatically that someone is being tortured or someone is being hurt. There's some evil going on. So you ask your friend, what's going on? What's that loud noise? And they say, no, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Anyway, you keep hearing that screaming, right? So you keep asking, what's wrong? What's going on in that room? So you decide to barge in the room yourself. And what you see is something very horrific. You see a man cutting off the leg of another man. And to you, your perception is this is extremely evil. Well, what if you, what if you came to know moments later that this is a medical doctor, in fact, a surgeon, amputating the leg of another man because he just got bit by a venomous, poisonous snake, and he needs to cut off his leg. He needs to amputate his leg to save his life. Your entire perception of evil has now changed to something good. And thus, this is exactly how it works. This is exactly how the world works, is you may perceive something to be evil, but in fact, the end goal is good. The end goal is goodness. Now, this is one way to approach the problem of evil. And by the way, this is called the problem of evil in the philosophical atheistic world. They, they made it a thing, and they call it the problem of evil. Um, another way to look at it is, of course, life is based on trial and test and tribulation. And, and, that's, and that's, that's fine, considering that, you know, the compeller, the determiner, has given us a set of trials to test which of us would pretty much succeed in our, in, in our deeds and our good deeds versus our evil deeds. But interestingly, we can, we can reference Surah Al-Falaq because Surah Al-Falaq says, Qul al-Falaq min shari ma khalaq. Min shari ma khalaq is from the evil of that which he created. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't attribute evil to himself directly, meaning Almighty God does not intend evil. And of course, consider the example of Musa and Khid, where Musa himself, alayhi salam, thought that Khid was doing something evil when he, when he was putting a hole in that, in that ship. But Musa at the time didn't know. He didn't know at the time, right, that Khid was doing that to actually prevent evil, to prevent harm of an oppressor, a tyrant, who was trying to really... Um, take those ships, take those ships on board for himself, right? But pretty much steal those ships. And so it's, it's understandable. It's very rational to acknowledge that the problem of evil is often a delusion and it's oft, often based on subjective preference. And honestly, here is the greatest refutation for an atheist who brings up this contention. This is the argument. If good and evil exist, then God exists. Simple as that. Ontologically, ontologically, meaning so ontology is a branch in philosophy that answers things like, does God exist? Does beauty exist? Does truth exist? Does evil exist? Because good and evil exist, these are objective parameters. They're not subjective, they're objective. If you believe in good, if you believe in evil, then we have to ask, where did good and evil come from? You cannot validate good and evil in the atheistic umbrella. How are you to prove, for instance, that murder is wrong or bad under atheism? How are you to prove that rape is bad under atheism? You honestly can. And this is why there's a difference between moral realism and moral relativism. We as Muslims believe in moral realism, meaning morality is given to us by the creator who created good and bad, good and evil. However, for the atheists, what do they have to rely on in terms of 
defining good and evil. What can they rely on except subjective preference? And so they cannot fully validate that what Hitler did, annihilating six million innocent people, is actually evil under atheism. They cannot. How can they prove it? Because Hitler himself thought what he was doing was good. Subjectively, people will think some people think murder is good, some people think murder is bad, some people think murder uh, rape is good, and others think rape is bad. Naudu billah. So the point is, under atheism, it's all subjective. It's all a subjective model, but it's only under theism, meaning the belief in God that you can validate good and evil. Thus, if an atheist believes in good and evil, by definition, they have to believe in a creator. Otherwise, they contradict themselves. And what's worse is atheists often adhere to something called moral nihilism, which is that good and evil don't exist, and it doesn't matter what anyone does to anyone. So if you chop off the head of a snowman, or if you chop off the head of a baby, it doesn't make a difference according to the moral nihilist point of view. Moral nihilism is very dangerous, and this is the danger of atheism. But anyway, um, that's a very kind of well-rounded refutation, and that kind of concludes the four contentions. Jazakumullah khair. We don't want to go overboard with time. We thank you for your patience. This was a topic. Is there a creator? Inshallah, I guess, uh, Brother Azad, if you want to take the lead on, if there's any questions, we can maybe take a few and end it. Yeah, Jazakumullah khair. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting topic, alhamdulillah. And um, we have some more of these uh, same discussion that is coming up. Um, I just wanted to ask the first uh, question, inshallah, and is um, the audience, inshallah, if you can formulate your question, and ask, we might answer just a couple other questions. Uh, coming back to the initial uh, cos cosmological ar argument um, that was, um, you said that was uh, made popular by William Lane Craig. I, I mean, this is, he, he took this from Imam Ghazali, right? Because Ghazali. I know Imam, yeah, Imam Ghazali talked about the Kalam. That's right, yeah. So he took it from uh, Imam Ghazali, that's um, really his motivation, and he called it Kalam because Imam Ghazali was the first Rahimahullah, he was the first to present it, and then he kind of, uh, you can say, inherited the philosophical idea in a sense, and and used it as a standard whenever he brought the cosmological argument. But this is, mashallah, beautiful. It's beautiful for the Islamic world because it brings light to the intelligence of of Islam in general, right? Because Islam has done so much, even in science, right? Ibn al-Haytham, who was the one who founded the scientific method, and Ghazali, who presented the Kalam cosmological argument, and of course, of course, algebra and things in architecture and, and, and other matters. The contributions are very evident in the Islamic exactly. world. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, I just got a couple of people, alhamdulillah, very, um, they're very uh, happy about, about your presentation, inshallah. And just because of time, inshallah, we're gonna just uh, end here because, you know, we're trying to finish on time. So maybe you can just close it off, and inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, barakallah fikum, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all, increase us in ilm, and continue to accept all the good that we do, and continue to make us conveyors of the message of Islam. We thank you all for your time. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka, wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam, jazakumullah khair, thank you. Wa antum fa jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum.